we arrived at work one morning and we went back to open the book drop and empty the books out and there inside was this tiny little kitten and he was buried under tons of books. The book drop was just full of books. People come in and they'll hear the story about how we acquired Dewey and they'll say, oh, you poor little thing. You were thrown in the book drop on that day. And I'll say, poor little thing, my foot. That was the luckiest day in that boy's life because he he's king around here and he knows it. charge of rodent control. Because we haven't seen any mice around, she's doing a good job, so she'll stay on the payroll. Herbie the cat, we consider him a, a part of the security force around here because he's always out front, main entrance, and uh, has never, as far as we know, uh, taken any money for his uh, assistance in security, but all he's asking for is a can of cat food and a drink of water, and he's happy that way. He is absolutely a member of the staff here. Um, in fact, his veterinarian gives him a library employee discount. His main job is marketing and public relations, and he couldn't do a better job if he went to school for it. I think our philosophy is best expressed by the concept on our membership card which is simple yet profound. How natural and good that every cat has a place of love and respect among them and especially the library cat. I think this sums it up quite well. I didn't realize that there were so many libraries that had cats and um, that there were people who were members who didn't have cats in libraries but just thought it was really an excellent idea and that you know we were, I sort of got the impression that we were sort of you know, like the, the women's suffragettes. You know, really, this was something that was good for people and that, you know, the library, library cat society was going to lead the way. We have known at least, well, over 30 libraries that do have cats in their libraries. Not all of these libraries or their staff have become members of our society. And considering that there are 15,000 public libraries, um, there seems to be much work to be done. I don't think that the, uh, what is it, the li Cat Library Society or whatever it is, uh, has the right to uh, even suggest that all libraries should have cats. We should have uh, the ability to use our independent judgment, and perhaps our First Amendment rights even. <laughs> We decided to buy a cat for the newly erected Douglas County Library and turned around in our heads thinking of what is a good name for a cat, Scottish Fold Cat with little turned down ears. We thought of, uh, we should get a name that meant something to librarians and libraries. Dewey and Decimal and all of that sort of thing we thought were 
possibly too common since cats had been fixtures in libraries for years. And we settled on Baker. Baker and Taylor Company is probably the world's largest distributor of books to both bookstores, libraries, uh, and what have you, any place where books are either sold or collected. We contacted Bill Hartman, who was the um, director of sales and marketing for the Baker and Taylor Company, and um, through internal maneuvers managed to get us enough money for Taylor. We've always had an excellent relationship with the Baker and Taylor Company, and we're happy that we honored them and they honored us by using these two lovable cats as their mascots. It's hard to find a library anywhere in, in the U.S. that's not aware of the Baker and Taylor cats. And when I go around and visit libraries, I often see one of the posters in the technical services department. So we know the cats are making the rounds of the nation's libraries. Baker and Taylor are very unassuming. They don't uh, consider their fame worth noting. But they do get their fair share of tourists. We've had librarians from the Caribbean and Canada and Europe come to see them. We've even had tour buses stopped. I can't imagine making a special trip just to see two cats, but then I make that trip every day. I believe what I like about people who like cats is the fact that they appreciate the independence of the cat. I think this is important. I like people who are independent, and I find that this transfers to cats who are, who are fiercely independent. And I like that. Independence shows resolve a spirit and a mind of your own. And this applies to the cat completely. A lot of people think that uh, the Now Meow was written by me, uh, since I write other books, but in, in fact it was written by Waldo, our oldest cat, Waldo Japussy. To kill a mouse, I must be at one with the meow, at one with the way. But I know that the mouse is also one with the way. This is why he has come my way, and I have come his way. There is no other way, so I kill him. He's in the way. We thought we had something similar to the monkeys that were going to type Shakespeare. Baker walked across the keyboard. He had no, uh, he was oblivious to things like obstructions in his path, and he, he typed highs several times on the keyboard, and uh, it all seemed sort of mystical. We didn't know whether he was um, attempting to communicate with us or was something from outer space. That, cat was a little bit from outer space. He's definitely an old soul. Um, a lot of animals I don't find that way, but when I feel old soul, it's like, that's the best way to describe an old soul. Wisdom beyond their years, I guess, is probably the best way to describe an old soul. He said, I'm in a cat suit, but there's just a lot of wisdom and healing behind him. So he's really more of a therapy cat than he is a library cat. A library is a perfect abode for a cat. I mean, it's absolutely perfect. It makes people feel good. It makes the cat feel good. People come in and they say, hey, cats live here. Uh, what could be better? Cats like serenity. Uh, what's more serene than a library? My goodness, a, a cat exudes serenity. A cat exudes zen, yoga, ballet, all of those things, and it can do them naturally. And we have to go to great pains to, to learn half of these things. A cat is uh, like, whereas if another animal walked into a meditation hall, it would be probably a disturbance, a duck or a dog or a snake. You know, it's, there's certain energy about them that, that probably they'd be asked to believe. But if a cat walks into a, into a meditation hall, I, I just think we'd probably just let it settle onto a nice soft cushion, we're probably seeking the sun if it was a cool day, and, and it would probably enhance everybody's meditation because they're so, they're so relaxed. In the same vein, if a student is in the library and, and uh, either trying to concentrate or trying to just seek comfort, I think that a cat would just, again, encourage and teach that person and enhance that situation. The librarians and the libraries, the patrons, the adults and the children are the recipients 
of the goodwill and service that these cats contribute to their library. And certainly our society needs both. I think we all need to, uh, to love and, and be loved. And Rosie was that. She was someone who would, would give her love unconditionally. She would climb up and sit on someone's lap who had never been near her before. And she would just choose that lap to sit on. And uh, imagine the feeling for someone who may not have had that experience to be chosen, to be, to be sat upon. I mean, I think that's a, that's a real neat feeling. It was amazing how many libraries commented on the fact that the cats actually, um, they thought, increased circulation, which is always, that's the bottom line for libraries, because funding is based, at least in Ohio, on circulation. Well, I have a, a people counter. It's a, it's a counter that, that counts the number of people in and out of the door, and the cat's tail is just high enough to make it click so that it looks like I have lots of people coming in and out here because the cat will sit in front of the door with his tail going back and forth and then people counters going click, 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 click. We've had people come in and say, could we check out Baker for the weekend? And I tell them he's reference only in library use. I understand that in some libraries, the librarian has been asked if a patron could check out the library cat. I haven't seen this in practice. But uh, I'm not so sure that um, I would uh, endorse it heartily. <laughs> I think the library cat uh, uh, that has a temperament that doesn't really fit in with this kind of thing. The library cat is not a toy. We had people ask if Baker, who would sleep very soundly on the counter, were stuffed. We assured them that yes, that was a live cat, and no, he was stuffed in one sense but not in another. Baker is absolutely or was absolutely addicted to cantaloupe. Uh, for a very silent cat he developed a strong high-pitched mew and would head for it even if it were 50 feet away he would smell cantaloupe. He ate the rind and all and he would carry half a cantaloupe around in his mouth and growl at anyone who tried to take it away from him. Taylor, on the other hand, couldn't care less about cantaloupe. He liked yogurt. His one problem was getting his head stuck in the little plastic cups. That's the price of gluttony. Today is Emily's birthday. We have a cake for her that has rats on it, rubber rats, you know, that you buy for cake decorations. Uh, many years ago, uh, the library acquired a kitten uh, who was named Muffin and became the library cat. Somehow, uh, many people perceived that this was a kind of a cool thing to do to have a library cat. A member on the Board of Trustees developed a very severe allergy to cats. She said, I have to resign. I cannot come into the library. The board took this under advisement and decided that they would find another home for Muffin and that the board member would be able to stay. One person is allergic to cats, so because of that, there should be no cat there, regardless of the feelings of over 300 other people who are willing to sign petitions to keep that cat there. So the right solution would have been, if this person was allergic to cats, just don't come to the library. The majority should prevail. And when a library does not go by the majority, the library suffers in the end. Was it worth selling our soul for the Mrs. Horton's $30,000? I think not. If we cannot operate in a manner that is ethically and morally correct, then there's not enough money in the world for that. is not designed, uh, you know, as a, uh, 
as an animal park, as a wildlife refuge, as uh, anything else. We now have a, uh, an animal-free environment in the Putnam Valley Library so that anybody with any allergies can come in and safely browse and uh, read and so on and so forth. I'm allergic to cats too. I sneeze a lot. So Fred basically, you know, lived here in, in the library and was very welcomed and accepted. And then out of the blue, this uh, controversy started with Mrs. Delaney. She said she was um, not only extremely afraid of cats, she had numerous allergies and that she couldn't breathe anywhere that a cat had been. So um, she was demanding that the cat be removed, and she was indicating that we had not taken her complaint seriously. But we tried to accommodate her, and we said that we would, if she would let us know when she was coming to the library, we'd put Fred out in the maintenance area, which we did for some other patrons, and it worked very satisfactorily. Um, we also said we would b bring books to her house. First of all, I don't think that they should have to bring books to my home. I consider my fear a handicap, but I don't consider myself a cripple. I should be able to walk into that library. And I should be able to walk into that library without the fear that someone will open a door and that cat will get out. There were some Fred supporters who were very extremist in their views. And it's unfortunate that Mrs. Delaney was getting death threats, phone death threats. Um, people were leaving dead mice in her mailbox. It was, it was, <laughs> I found that personally very sad. They treat people who are afraid of cats as if they're lepers or crazy or something. And fear is fear no matter whether it's afraid of a cat, afraid of a spider, afraid of a snake or afraid to fly. This doesn't make me a ridiculous person. It doesn't make me an idiot or stupid. It just makes me a person with a handicap. People should be considerate because of this. And thank God that they don't have this fear themselves. I don't think there's a person on this earth that, that, that doesn't have some kind of a fear. Unfortunately, mine is of cats. There seems to be no middle ground for discussion at times mm -hmm. because uh, the emotions among the participants uh, are, are quite high. And however, mercifully, um, the cat who is under question is not aware of this. If we had had many people in town who objected to a cat in the library, we might have come up with a different decision. But at that point, we had legal backing, we had public backing, and we felt that we could go ahead and keep Fred. There was a meeting that night that they had whether they would keep the, the cat and keep me out of the library. And a vet in the town actually sent flowers the next day to the cat. Now, if these people aren't insane, I don't know what they are. Unfortunately, people have more compassion for animals than they do for humans. Bookums wrote a letter to Fred um, telling him that he was supporting his stand on being able to stay at his library. And he felt that he and Fred should unite and get all the other library cats to unite and, and back each other up because they felt that they should all be able to keep their positions. And when Fred's picture ran in People magazine, there was mention of Bookham's letter and also Bookham's slogan, Library Cats Unite. I've wrestled with the issue of the ethics of having a cat in the library. If people have a problem with Dewey, we're glad to lock him up. We reassure them over and over that the doctors have said that they would have to stay quite a while or pick him up to be bothered by it. We can't please everyone. We never could and we never will. But the overwhelming support that Dewey has and the marvelous good things that he's done here, I think far outweigh any problems that he might cause to someone. I really would hate to see anyone not be able to use the library because they're allergic to cats. The problem with the allergies is that the dander from the animal gets everywhere in the building and it's pretty much impossible to totally remove. One of the aims of the Library Cat Society in view of these serious obstacles is still to promote the establishment of a cat or cats in a library setting. If a hundred people are for something and you have one person that's against it, who do you listen to? 
your heart is tugged in both directions because you understand what this person is saying and you sympathize with that person. But what about the people who love an animal and want to keep that animal? Um, then what do you do? I mean, you're taking, you're taking that pleasure away from all those people to satisfy the pleasure of one. Um, it, it's, a hard, it's a hard question. It's a, it's a really hard question. If we think just in terms of what the majority wants as opposed to what the minority wants, um, we've somehow left justice out of the door. We're just weighing these interests. Some of them may be vital. Some of them may be peripheral. For some people in the minority, it may be a life-threatening um, situation. For some people in the majority, their interests may be based on illusion or might be uh, peripheral or minor interests. So that kind of cost-benefit analysis approach to ethics doesn't work in theory for me for any problem, let alone the library cat's problem. If we had at least one family who I think almost everybody in the family was allergic to animals, uh, cats and cat dander or whatever in particular. And they would purposely bring their kids in here because this was the only chance the kids had to be around a cat. And then before the allergies really started to kick in, they could leave. These are public pets in, in a sense, much as the ducks at the park uh, that people feed are, are public pets. And the cats at the library are their cats as well as ours. An elementary school teacher in Ohio somehow had found out about the Baker and Taylor cats and decided that this would be a really neat project for her class. She's had the kids write letters to the cats and send them birthday cards, you know, make cards for them. To them, Baker and Taylor are almost not real <laughs> because they've never really seen them. And they'll say, are they really real, Miss Cram? Yes, they are really real cats, and they really live in a library. Baker and Taylor are library cats. They're Baker became a little quieter, a little bit more withdrawn. I think almost overnight his uh, uh, condition became very apparent. His lungs filled up with fluid. He was having difficulty breathing and I took him down to his vet of record whose office is covered with pictures of Baker and Taylor. And um, we were both in tears. and we made the decision to put him to sleep. Um, I went back to work, I don't know why. I, I guess because I thought if I went home I would uh, get even worse. So I felt if I just stayed at my desk and cried and worked, I, I'd be okay. Uh, the worst thing I think was um, Taylor. The cats were very rarely separated throughout their lives and Taylor spent I think a month looking for Baker every day in all the places that Baker would would ordinarily go. He would look for Baker and Baker wasn't there. Uh, 
Taylor got more vocal. He meowed more. Bring him back, bring him back. That's all I could think of. Um, to this day, he still does a little bit of a look around first thing in the morning to see if possibly we were hiding Baker outside. We also thought that we would um, put a plaque up honoring Baker. He was, he wasn't much. I mean, he, he was a cat, but he was a lot of people's friends. Um, our patrons, people who wrote and asked about him from a uh, great distance after they'd once seen him and met him, but he, he was a personable guy, kind of guy that you kind of like to hang out with. We had a little ceremony for Baker, and some of his nearest and dearest came by, and we had cookies, which he would have liked, and we didn't have cantaloupe. The library camp will probably always be here, because there's a lot of us crazy cat people out there, I'll tell you. And those cats know how to find us. I would advise libraries to try it. But of course, you, you want to make sure that the cat has a place to go if it is not accepted in the library. But give it a try, because it has proven to be worthwhile and workable in many libraries. And it might be in your library. Give it a try. Vertebrates. Um, a lot of kids just love it that we have three little hermit crabs. It really breaks the ice. <laughs> <laughs> 